Hi, everybody. It's really great to be here. Fun both to be invited to talk and also to listen to everybody else and what they have got to say. Uh, I will actually attempt to tell you a, a fairy tale here today. And it's a tale of uh, green marketing. Now, why would I tell you a fairy tale? Because I'm a brand consultant and a communications consultant dealing mainly with social and environmental issues. And what we have been telling our customers for years is that they should engage their publics in so-called storytelling. So I thought I would attempt to tell you a story myself. Now, there are certain elements to anyone's story to make it successful, aren't there? So for one, we need to have a perfect little world to be at the beginning of our story. And as a second element, we need to have a threat to this perfect little world, a seemingly unsurmountable challenge. We then need to summon our heroes to help us fight this threat. And since it is a classic story, after a ferocious battle, we will certainly want to have our happy ending. And since it is a classic story, we will also abide to the law of three, because you know that no fairy tale can be successful without the three magical ingredients. So let's see if we can make that happen. Now, the first thing that we need then is a perfect little world. Now, do we have a perfect world? Well, we can certainly debate whether it's perfect or not, but I'm sure that you'll agree with me that the planet where we live is a pretty fantastic place to be. And it's the place where human beings have evolved over millions of years. And apart from what some science fiction geeks might tell you, it's actually the only place in the universe that we know of today where we can actually live. So it would seem that we have little choice but saving this world. That is, if it should be in trouble. Now, what does this world consist of? Well, you will not be surprised when I tell you that it has three cornerstones. So the first one is the so-called ecosystem. It's the planet where we live. And we need to have a living planet or else we will not be alive either. Now, our colleagues down at Stockholm Resilience Center in Stockholm has defined that there are nine planetary boundaries that we as human beings shall not cross if we want to stay alive. And the second cornerstone is the society comprised of all of us people living on this planet today. And the third cornerstone is what we call the economy. It's the smallest cornerstone because it exists within our human society. And it's the means to an end of providing as many people as possible in this world with welfare and happiness. That's what the economy is for. And they need to be working in harmony, these three cornerstones, or else we will have that problem, that threat that we were looking for in the beginning. Now, are they working in harmony, do you think? <laughs> so it seems that the smallest cornerstone actually has developed a little bit of an ego problem because it seems to be thinking that it is, in fact, the biggest cornerstone, that it is, the, in fact, the foundation upon which everything else rests and that it is the laws of the economy that we all need to abide to and nothing else. Thus leading us to conclusions such as this. Just need to buy more shit or we're all fucked. Or you could just turn it around because we buy lots of shit, we're all fucked. Well, <laughs> it depends a little bit who's talking about it. But apart from having us all being shopaholics, we've also got ourselves some deeper problems because we base this economy in part on false friends such as fossil fuels. So, we have threats in terms of man-made climate change, for example, which threatens coral reefs, such as this one, which used to be alive and is now dead. Um, we also have a, another number of other problems, such as nine of the great ten fishes in the oceans 
already have been fished out. Also, after decades of intensive industrial farming, it turns out that many of our fruits and vegetables have in fact lost between 60 to 80 percent of their vitamins and minerals. It's not good news. Things are happening to our food. And while there is about a billion people on the planet who are overweight today, we have another billion people who actually lack access to adequate drinking water. So the difference between the rich and the poor is increasing. In addition to this, we, for example, have uh, 30,000 chemicals spread out over the planet, that is very lowly calculated, some talk about 70,000 chemicals, whose effects upon mankind and the species of this planet are in fact little known and little researched. Well, we have a number of other issues as well, but I will not dwell on this. But it does seem that we have a little bit of a threat upon our world. It may need some saving. So it seems that time has come to summon the heroes to the battle. Now, since I'm a marketer, when I summon heroes to a battle, I don't go up to the towers of the castle asking all the knights to join in the courtyard. Rather, I turn to more model tools, such as market segmentation models. And this is one that... I've often used, it's called Ungdomsbarometer, or the Youth Barometer. It actually divides the Swedish population into seven different lifestyle groups. So it runs on two axes, as you will see, from the people who are more materialistically minded and over to the people who are more idealistic, that is, they're more attractive to concepts and ideas. And it runs from the people who are very focused on the here and now, that are situation-oriented, up until the people who can put a longer time frame upon their behavior that are more goal-oriented, for example, more attracted to higher education, and so forth. So, if we go look for our heroes, we will find them up among the goal-oriented, more idealistic people. So it seems we have found our three musketeers. They're called Ambitious Anna, Engaged Emil, and Alternative Alice, because that's what they're actually called in this survey. And I could tell you all about them, what they wear, what type of TV shows they like, what they buy, and what the drivers and motivators are, but we don't have time for that because we need to save the world. So I will put them right into action. Now, when these guys go out there in the battlefield to save the world, then where do they go? Because here in Sweden, we don't fight our battles so much anymore out in the fields, outside of our villages, nor do we actually fight them as was common a couple of decades ago in the streets in massive political demonstrations. No, I think that today's battles are mainly fought in the marketplace. So these guys will either want to demonstrate their consumer power or they will in fact start a business of their own, which is what we will have them do. Saving the world by becoming an entrepreneur. Now what type of business would they start? Actually, you will not be surprised when I tell you that when I look at businesses, I divide them into three different groups. And so the first group of companies are the companies that have product and profit, but no idea about corporate responsibility, no environmental or social policy. And that obviously would not be the kind of company that they would start. The second company is what today you would call business as usual. It's the big, for example, multinationals who have great products, great profits, and a social and environmental policy but it's not core. And that also is not where our heroes would go. By the way, those heroes, they comprise about 50% of the population today, so it's not a small group that we can inspire with these things. And then there is the third group of companies, 
And that is to companies that have great products, that have great profit, but it's not profit at any price. Because also social and environmental issues are very much at the core of developing strategies, of developing marketing, and so forth. So that is the category three, and that is obviously where Anna and Emil and Alice would go, and that's the kind of company that they would start. Now you will ask yourselves, are they the first to start a company such as this one? Is this just a dream, or can this actually happen? No, fact is that when Anna and Emil and Alice go out there to start their company, they will be an increasingly growing company of businesses. And here are just some examples. I could dwell on this forever, but I will not. I will just tell you, you will certainly recognize the ice cream company Ben & Jerry's, famous for great taste, but also for their social mission. You can find here Stonyfield Farm, which is the world's largest organic dairy company, also the third largest yogurt brand in the U.S., which has developed, gotten to that marketplace actually without having a marketing budget at all. Or you will find Patagonia famous for great outdoor clothing. Also, if you think that this is a small trend, I just want to tell you that the guy who runs the incubator down here at a local business university for the students who, upon graduation, want to start a company, tells me that 40% of the students at the business school actually want to start this type of a social entrepreneurship company. So what I think is that this is definitely the business life of tomorrow. Since we don't have time to dwell upon each and every one of these companies. Instead, what we will do is ask ourselves, because there's been analysis on this, do they have any traits in common that Anna and Alice and Emil could learn from? Are there any magic traits to these companies? Well, yes, in fact, there are three. So, for one, these companies are visionary. They don't just have a vision for making the most money, they also got a vision to solve social and environmental issues, such as Interface, one of the world's largest carpet manufacturers, who actually have a vision to restore the world's environment, not just damage it less. But they don't just have visions, because dreaming alone is certainly not enough. So they're also very good at living as they preach. So their actions speak louder than words, which is, for example, why when Patagonia built their new headquarters. They used 98% recycled steel for the building and 98.5% wood that was reclaimed after forest fires and old buildings, thus taking sustainability a step further. And also, perhaps more surprisingly, it turns out that these companies are in fact extraordinarily good at creating relationships, which is inter interesting from a marketer's perspective. They're very good at keeping the dialogue alive and of telling their story in a neat way. Because that obviously brings us to the next question. Once you've summoned your heroes to the battlefield and found out that the battle is taking place in the market, now how is that battle actually going to be fought? Are you going to fight your battle by putting your commercial message on huge electronic billboards? Are you going to fight a battle by putting your advertising on eggs, like they do in the US, or on milk containers, in direct mail, or in SMS, always increasingly up in your customer's face, never leaving them alone? No, I think actually that's not how we will fight the battle of tomorrow, given that 25 to 30 percent of Swedish people actually have a no thank you to advertisement put up on their mailbox, for example. They're tired of this. Now, I think that the battle of tomorrow is not so much a battle at all. It is, in fact, the question of who has the most friends. It is, in fact, the question of who can build the tightest social web.
and who can engage and share with their publics in the most meaningful context. That is what the battle for these type of companies is actually about. That is why when Alice and Emil and Anna go out to fight their battle, they might look, for example, at things like this. The innocent smoothies engaged half a million British people into knitting little hats for <laughs> smoothie bottles. Well, you can debate whether that is a meaningful activity or not, but it spurs a lot of creativity, and for every little hat that is knit, Innocent donates 50p to elder care in Britain. That's also connecting a bond between the elderly and the rest of the British population. Or you could actually look at campaigns like Earth Hour, where you, in 120 countries, in 24 time zones, for 24 hours, you actually flick the switch for an hour, turning the city dark in a very visual manifestation to show that the world is united against climate change. It's also a fun and an engaging way to go about business. Or you can do like Patagonia, for example. Erect a national park in Patagonia, in Chile, and save wildlife and restore wildlife corridors. Those are the kind of activities that you could engage in, using social media, using events like this, engaging people, talking to people, not just putting up commercial messages in their faces. So, having done all that, fighting the battle this way, will we then have our happy ending? Well, at least facts go to show that these companies, they perform above average in terms of profit within their markets. They also save a lot of money because being smart about the environment is also being smart about your own economy. Also, they save a lot of money on advertising because they don't need to have as much advertising budgets. Instead, they create more word of mouth, they get more ambassadors, and they get more press. That is why Patagonia has only a tenth of the marketing budget of its competitors in the clothing industry, but gets press coverage ten times as much as they have advertising budget. It goes to show also they increase customer loyalty. That is why when Max Hamburger restaurants here in Sweden launched their ambitious climate activities, they actually jumped to place nine on the brand ratings, also being the company that most increased its loyalty among its customers. And just a couple of years back, they were at the bottom of those rankings. And also, I think it goes to show that these companies are not just important in and of themselves, but also because they challenge what is called the business as usual, to take more prior strides towards sustainability. And now, since you are aware, of course, of this trend, and you also will want to be friends with these companies, you will pitch in and direct your businesses from business as usual into becoming the social entrepreneurs of tomorrow, also using, of course, your consumer power, then what else could we have but a happy ending? Well, thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>